But uh, I, do, I do have a word for you, and, um, you know, whenever, whenever Pastor Trisha and Peter were, were telling me about the family revival happening here and the heart for prodigals, of course, that just lit me on fire. I mean, this is, this is my whole heart, is, is this message, you know, of prodigals and hope and prayer and intercession and the importance of it. And having lived it now, I think it's, it, it's, so, it's so real, it's so needed, and it's so much more powerful than any of us realize. And until you either get on the other side of it, of a victory, or you get on the other side of eternity, is I think whenever you see how powerful those prayers are. And, you know, that, that's one of the things that I want to share with you today is uh, a lot of my story. I know many of you already met a couple of front porch friends here. How many of you are front porch friends? Um, nice. Oh, there's a bunch of you. Good. Uh, if you don't know what that is, my mother, uh, after, after she went through the journey of intercession, um, you know, we, we really wanted to find a way to give people hope and, and to give them, you know, things that we were feeling or hearing for them. And so on uh, Wednesday nights, I believe it's at 10 o'clock here, Eastern time, is that right? I think it's 10 o'clock Eastern time. Um, on her Facebook, she does a Front Porch Friends. And the name of it comes from the prodigal story when it says, he stood on the por- porch watching the road for when his son would return. And so, um, so she called it Front Porch Friends of, of the people who were standing on the porch waiting for the prodigals to return. And so every Wednesday at, at 10 o'clock, she goes on there and shares uh, words that she has and things that she has felt. My sister and I are on there sometimes. Um, but it's, it's turned into uh, an entire club of people, and it's so fun. We have front porch conferences now, and, and it's just a blast. Um, so what I want you to do is uh, turn with me, if you will, to Exodus. I believe it's chapter 6. Yes, Exodus 6. And my husband would kill me for reading out of the um, NLT version. He is a diehard KJV, or he reads his Bible in Greek because I married a nerd. And I did. I married a true nerd. He is a, if you know anything about the Enneagrams, he is a five with a wing of a five and a side of a five and researches everything. So, um, so yeah, so don't tell him I used, not his version. So I'm going to start, it's chapter 6, verse 6, and it says, Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I, then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as your very own possession, for I am the Lord. So, Lord, we pray right now, God, that as we have gathered here this morning, Lord, that you would touch the hearts of everybody here, that everyone here would leave with hope, that, God, you know where all of the prodigals are, you know what they are doing, and, God, you can reach them in a way that we never could. You can get them in their darkest place, in the most impossible situations, God. It is not too hard for you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I know my mother, whenever she was here, she shared um, some of her story of, of the journey of intercession. But I really wanted to kind of leave you with, with this side of it, of the prodigal. And, um, and really what it's like to, to be on the other side of the pig pen, to be the one in the pig pen, and, and how you end up there, and how easy it is to get there. And, you know, from somebody who was raised in the ministry, as I mean, many of you have raised your kids in the presence of God. Most of you have, if not all of you. And I, I was the one that believed, you know, okay, um, you know, my mom was Karen Wheaton, I mean, literally grew up on this on the platform. I mean, she's carrying me in her stomach two weeks before I'm born, singing on the stage, I'm on the bus. You know, this was our life. And, and it's easy for us to almost become immune to the fact that, you know, the enemy can attack us too. It doesn't matter 
who we come from. It doesn't matter who we come through. It doesn't matter how godly and incredible our parents are and how well they raised us in the Word and how much we saw them pray at our bedsides at night and fall asleep to them praying at night. It doesn't make us immune to the attack of the enemy. And it doesn't make it your fault whenever they are attacked. That I, I found I can't ride on the coattails of my mom's salvation. It doesn't matter who she is. It doesn't matter what she does. It doesn't matter how much she prays in tongues. It doesn't mean that I have a walk with God. I mean, she does. It means she's doing everything in her power to raise me right, to raise me in the presence of God. But if I don't have that encounter for myself, if I don't hunger for that encounter for myself, I'm never going to have it, no matter what she did. That is between me and God and nobody else. And even though despite being raised in, in the ministry and despite, you know, having this every single day in front of me, I still grew up with, for me, a father wound from my biological father. Um, my parents were divorced when I was eight, um, and I, I always kind of carried that pain through my childhood and teen years. You know, but of course, I mean, like how many of us don't have a father wound? I mean, the majority, majority of humanity does, which is tragic, but we do. And it's, you know, it was just another, okay, I'm just another divorce case and I'll be fine. I mean, how many of this, half of the marriages in the world are this, half of the kids in the world go through this. I'm just another one of the statistics and that's okay and I'll be fine. And I never dealt with that pain. And so because of that, I carried that pain into teen relationships, into dating, into trying to find somebody to please fulfill this in me. And it didn't matter how many times I went to the altar because, I mean, we did. You know, we had altar calls for everything you could imagine under the sun. You know, I go up to the altar and you get oil thrown on you and, you know, laid out and you're shaking in the floor and you get up and you pick the pain right back up and walk away. Because it, it, was, it, it was a different journey that I realized what it really takes to lay something completely down and walk away from it. That just going to the altar and getting prayed for didn't mean you were free. It just meant you made the decision to get free. But there was a whole journey to attached to that that I never took. And I didn't take it for many, many years. I took all of that pain into a marriage. I met my husband when I was, actually, I met him when I was about 14. He and I became very, very good friends. And, and of course, southern fashion in small town, everybody knows everybody. So my boyfriend at the time and Casey, my husband, his girlfriend at the time were first cousins. So that's how we met, because it was the family, and then we were, you know, I was dating this one, he was dating that one, and we all hung out together and went to Subway, because it was the only restaurant Hamilton had, and we would all just hang out after church. And so he and I became good friends. We started dating when I was 16, and engaged at 17, married at 18, pregnant at 19, had a kid at 20s, <laughs> back to back, and just one thing after another. And um, But two kids later, and I'm serving in the ministry at the time, my husband was a pastor of Ramp Church and the director of the School of Ministry there. I uh, was in charge of all of the choreography and everything that, that moved on the stage. I oversaw all of it. But because I still kind of carried that pain, the job became my God. Because that's where I felt affirmed. That's where I felt important. That's where I felt like I was good. That's where I had the attention. And it became God to me. And whenever you have those underlying pains, those underlying wounds, it is fertile soil for the enemy to come and plant seeds of deception. And again, it didn't matter that I was raised in church. Pain is soil for the enemy. Offense is soil for the enemy. Hatred, bitterness, pride, all of those things was perfect ground for him to plant an entire garden of deception in my life. And it's not to blame the enemy, because, I mean, this was my fault completely, but the enemy was at work. And so, of course, the enemy doesn't come as, you know, the, the devil with the horns and the pitchfork and tells you, you know, hey, if you do this, you're going to hate yourself and you're going to absolutely ruin your life, but you should do it. You know, the enemy comes as everything that you want. And we think, you know, that there's a difference between demonic, or there's not a difference between demonic and satanic, and there is. Demonic is, is darkness. You know, it's witchcraft. It, it's darkness. Satanic is different. Satanic is false light. 
Because Satan is Lucifer. He was the angel of light. Whenever deception comes, even whenever he came to Eve in the earliest days, he came to Eve as false light. He didn't go to Eve and say, hey, you're going to do this and you're going to die and ruin everything for all of humanity and all the women of the world are going to hate you because it's really going to hurt whenever they have kids. But, you know, it'll be fine. It'll be just take it. You'll love it. You know, he didn't do that. He came as something that she wanted. He came as what she wanted the most. He came to her as what was intriguing to her. And the enemy is coming at your loved one, not as darkness, but to them, he's coming to them as light. Because to you, who is not in darkness, you are not living in deception. For you, whenever you see this in their lives and you're thinking, do you not see what you're doing? No, they don't. The enemy told me, I fully believed with everything in me that what I was doing was not only right, it was God's will for my life. So God, or the enemy sent to me, Satan sent to me what I needed the most. And that was that feeling of, of a whole relationship, feeling loved, feeling affirmed. So, of course, he sent a guy. And this guy was my uh, dance partner for many years in, uh, through the ramp. And, of course, it never became anything physical because we were Christians, you know. And so it was the emotional affair because it's the Christian's way of having an affair without having an affair. Because the church people can still have the affair without actually going into bed with this person because then that would really be adultery. But no, my heart is gone. I have no feelings for my spouse at all. This guy has become my best friend. This guy is everything I want. But we're not committing adultery because we've not been physical. So I entered into a full-blown emotional affair with this guy. Long story short, uh, four years later, I made the decision to walk away from my marriage from my ministry, from everything. And for it sent us on a two-year journey. For me, it was a two-year journey of pure hell. For my family, a two-year journey of intercession, with the end being somewhere we never knew was even possible. And so I wanted to shed some light even for you, if you are in the beginning of your journey of intercession, or you might be in the beginning of your journey of deception. I don't know. Only God knows, only you know. But I wanted to answer some of these questions that I think you might have. The first one being, how in the world did this happen? How did this child that I gave birth to and raised and loved and did this right, how did this happen? It could have been a friend. It could have been a movie. It could have been a song. This is not to say, you know, we have to be afraid of these things because we shouldn't be afraid of these things. But it was just one drop at a time into a cup that eventually that cup becomes full and eventually it overflows and we don't even see it until the overflow happens. And we're sitting there thinking, my God, they changed overnight. They didn't. They didn't change overnight. This has been a long time coming. We just didn't see it. We never saw it. For me, it started at eight years old and it didn't come out until 28. We never saw it coming because it was a drop of deception at a time, a relationship here, a word there, a mindset here, a a way of life over here. Oh, Lindsay, wouldn't this be so wonderful if you could live free and without responsibility? So really, God's will for you is not marriage and not ministry. God's will for you is freedom. When really the enemy, whenever he's telling me this is freedom, the reality is that's bondage. But the light he is painting it in is freedom. The other thing is the difference of sin and deception. You know, we look at these things that, that our loved ones are doing, even some of the things that, that I did, and, and it differs so much, you know, from being deceived and, and just living in blatant sin. You know, whenever you think of someone living in blatant sin, you know, you think of, I don't know, like I don't know, an addict or an alcoholic. You know, I mean, just somebody that is, you know, this, this, is, this is who I am. This is what I do, I'm doing. I know it's wrong, and I'm going to do it anyway. That is sin. Sin is, I, I know this is not what I'm supposed to do, but, hey, I'm doing it. This would be fun. Deception is... I believe with everything in me this is right. And I'm going to fight with you and twist the word of God to tell you that what I'm doing is right. Even though it's wrong, I believe this is right. God is telling me this is right. I used to paint. I I love painting. I love um, charcoal work. I, I do it at home in my free time. 
And whenever I was gone, I had in my house, like a, it was like a little art gallery of work between me and my kids that we would do. And there was one of them that I had painted. This is, it, I mean, I'd completely twisted God's word. And I'd paint on there the verse in Exodus where it says, the Egyptians you see today, you will see no more. To me, the Egyptians were Casey, my mother, everybody at the ramp. Because that, that's who I believed the Egyptians in my life were. When in reality, I was almost prophesying over myself without meaning to. And even in twisting the word, the word cannot come back void. So even whenever your loved one twists the word and they manipulate it and say, well, doesn't the Bible say this? Doesn't it say that? Yeah, it does. And you can't argue with them because it's a lose-lose situation. Every single time you try and talk to them, it's like talking to a brick wall. But whenever they are speaking the word, see it in faith as they're speaking this over themselves. In their mind, they're twisting it. In God's mind, they're just prophesying over themselves. In God's mind, whenever I painted that, I, I, I have to believe that God had, had this great sense of humor that whenever he's painting that, he looks over at Jesus and he's like, <laughs> look what she put in her house. Because <laughs> he knew the Egyptians I saw then I would never see again. And it wasn't my family. It was the enemy attacking my home. That, 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 those were the real Egyptians, the enemy attacking my family. The last thing is... How do you reach them? How, how do you talk to somebody? How do you get to their heart? How do you reach someone that is just completely and totally unreachable? You, I mean, you can't hear them. They don't want, they don't want to speak to you. I mean, I, I'd got to the point where I blocked my mom on everything. I would block her on social media. I would block her on my phone. And then I'd miss her and I'd unblock her. And then I'd get mad and I'd block her again. And it was just that cycle for two years you know, how, how do you talk to them? It is true, whenever somebody is in deception, you are in a lose-lose with them. That's not to leave you hopeless. But it is a lose-lose because you're talking to a filter. You're talking to somebody that is not them. If I have on glasses and they are tinted red, and I look at this, and you say, oh, this is, this is white and gold, I'm going to say, no, that's, that's yellow and, and orange. Because I'm looking through filtered glasses. I'm looking through something that is, that is distracting. It's, it's distorting my vision. So whenever you speak to them, you're speaking through a filter of deception. So whenever you say truth to them, that truth is going to be twisted and thrown back at you right in your face in ways that are unfathomably painful. But I will say this, and this, this, is, this is one of the things I wanted to read to you. To, and I think... It's, it, reading it to you is a little easier than even trying to explain it. After I came home, I wanted to, I wanted to create almost just a series of letters. Of, and, and this is another one of the things that I just I, I do in my free time. And, um, and so I thought if, if I could say anything to my mother and to my husband five years ago, six years ago, you know, if I, if I could go back in time and say... This is what I would say to you in the middle of this. This is what it would be. And this is one of them. This one, and, and it's a series of letters. We call them the prodigal letters. And they're actually out there at the table. And it says, uh, from your prodigal at the pig pen. And it's to my praying loved one. And if they could say anything to you, this would be it. And this is why you cannot reach them. This is, this is if you were to remove that filter... This is really how they feel. It says, dear hopeful loved one, I say you did this to me, and I say I hate you for it more than you will ever know. But I'm about to tell you something that I will never, ever actually say to you. To admit these things to you make me seem, makes me seem weak. And that weakness is exactly what would destroy me, even if I only feel it by myself. I need to say it for you to understand and finally accept what I am, and the choices I have made. I say I hate everything you stand for. And I hate that you will not accept me for who I really, but not really am. But more than anything, I hate that I don't hate you. I hate when I say I hate you. It means I hate the way you bring me back to myself. The self I have tried to destroy. The self you know is still in there somewhere. 
When I hate you for praying, I really hate the conviction I feel when I hear and see you on your knees bombarding heaven for me while I stand there holding the stone in my hand. I hate that I don't want you to stop praying. Equally so, I hate that you will never, ever stop. It sets me on edge seeing you stand in the gap between me and heaven because I know that where I am now, I will not stand there for myself. My life is not your responsibility, but you carry me like a burden on your back and you lay me at the foot of the cross every day. I hate the truth you carry because of the lies I have to constantly create to cover these tracks I have laid. I hate this train ride to nowhere. Things will never be the same, and while I know it's my fault, I will never speak it, not because I fear you, but because I fear me. I fear the seams that will unravel, tearing me into a thousand pieces. When I pull away at your embrace, it is because I feel, and being around you makes me feel more. I hate that I shove you away because I so desperately want you around. I hate that I want to pick up the phone and hear your voice say my name on the other end of the line. I hate that you want me, and I hate that I want you even more. I have surrounded myself with people who hate you, and in reality, it makes me angry they hate you because I still love you. Despite the betrayal, you won't give up on me. You still love me, and I really, really hate me. I hate the mask I put on to make you think this is what I really want. It's not what I want. But I hope the pride I carry makes you think I'm okay. I hate the control I use, so I will blame it on you and call you controlling instead. I hate being afraid. I hate the paranoia I feel that I will be caught in my actions. I hate wanting so badly to lay with my head in your lap. Now you know I want you to hate me, and I hate you never will. And it is signed, Love Your Prodigal. So if there is anything that... They could say to you, but won't. That's what they really feel. It's not you they're mad at. It's them. They hate themselves. But since, since they can't face the truth of their own life and their own decisions, they have to blame that on somebody. And they're going to blame that on the person that is closest to them. Their spouse, their mother, their father, sister, best friends. They have to find somebody to hate. And if it can't be them, it has to be the next closest person. I never knew how powerful and how, how, how <laughs> unbelievable that your prayers are until I came home. I never knew how powerful prayer was until I started on the other end of this journey and my mother and I, we were, we were sitting there comparing um, dates. It was right after I came home. And she brought her journal to me one day, and um, she had actually, in, in, in her book, she has actually her actual journal entries in her book. And they're all kind of coded because she was so afraid at the time that I would find her journal and know that she was writing about me. So she kind of like sneakily like said certain things or used initials so I wouldn't know it was about me. Um, but... So many of the things that she would write on certain days, it was mind-blowing because there would be something that I was doing, a relationship that I was in, I was I mean, in those two years, while my husband is staying completely faithful and believing God for an absolute miracle for his wife to come home, I was in a slew of relationships. And I would be in one relationship, it would be getting fairly serious, and then out of nowhere, get a text from the guy that said, I can't do this anymore, I'm sorry. And then after I come home, look at my mom's journal, and it was the day she prayed, God, you do whatever you have to do to end this relationship. That is the honest to God truth. One after another, after another, after another. You have no concept of what your prayers are doing. And most of the time for you, you feel like you're just sowing into desert, that it's not working. It's just getting worse. It's getting worse. It might be, but you don't know. What's happening in the spirit realm? You don't know the people that they're meeting. You don't know who God is using in whatever situation they are in. You don't know if it is a bartender going to your loved one saying, you know, what are you doing here? You don't know. You have no idea. But I tell you what, the only way you'll never find out is if you quit. 
the only way you will lose this battle is if you quit. I think one of my favorite moments, and I actually, I have, we've searched for, don't put it up yet, I'll tell you when I put it up, but we've searched for, um, I think, six, seven years to find this picture. We finally found it two weeks ago. I was so excited. But my favorite moment of, um, of God tattletelling on me to my mother, because God will do that. Even if you're an adult, he will do that. And my favorite moment of God tattletelling on me, um, the guy that I'd left my husband for, he and I, whenever it all first went down, and I left my husband and, every, and everything, and he and I decided, okay, we're not going to talk until the dust clears, and, you know, everything settles down, and then we'll, you know, kind of pick up the pieces, and, you know, you date people, I'll date people, and we'll pick up the pieces later, and then just see where, where this goes. And so that was in um, March of 2014. So now you fast forward a year later, and we've not spoken or anything. His little brother was in a play um, a couple of hours from Hamilton. So Hamilton is where we live. Jackson, Tennessee is where the play was. So it was about two and a half hours away. And so he wanted me to come. His brother wanted me to come see him in the play. So because I couldn't contact this guy, I stayed in contact with his mom because that way we wouldn't be lying if we said we weren't talking, you know, because we're good Christian people. And, I mean, all this time, we're still in church. We're still serving in churches that we were going get. And, you know, we were going to stay faithful and, and honest. And meanwhile, I'm still married. We're separated, but I'm still married. And so we, uh, I drive up to Jackson, Tennessee. I did not tell a soul I was going to Jackson, Tennessee. Not a soul. Nobody. My husband had our girls. They were three and a half days with me, three and a half with him. He had them. Nobody knew. Nobody. I drive up to Jackson. I am two miles from my destination. I get pulled over for speeding. I'm like, okay, whatever. And I'm thinking, you know, okay, it's going to like, I'll be a couple minutes late. So I text his mom, you know, hey, I got pulled over. I'm going to be late. I'm pretty sure they're giving me a ticket. This is taking forever. And it was. It was taking forever. I mean, it was 20, 30 minutes. I'm still waiting. And I'm like, dear God. And so then while I'm waiting, another cop car pulls up. Pulls up. Now, I love the show Cops. I love watching people get caught. I think it's genuinely, like, funny to me. I'm like, oh, man, why are you so stupid, sucker? You know? <laughs> And, like, I, I think it's just, it's just comical to me watching these people. And I'm like, D- are you stupid? Like, why would you do this? You know? And, and so I'm sitting there in my car, and these cop cars are behind me. And I'm thinking, like, oh, my gosh, there's, like, a drug bust somewhere. And I get to watch this go down. This is great. You know? And so I'm so excited to see this happen. And so the cop comes up, and he tells me, you know, ma'am, step out of your vehicle. I'm like, okay. So I step out, and he Mirandizes me. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. I'm like, ah, what? <sighs> and he's like, you're under arrest. For what? I have a suspended license. I don't have a suspended license. Yeah, you do. Yeah, I don't. I, I, you don't understand. You have the wrong person. I don't have a suspended license. And so he actually takes me to his car on his computer where it has a picture of my license and it says suspended. And so because of Tennessee law, I couldn't just leave. I have to go to jail. So I text this woman, I'm not going to make it tonight. I'm going to jail. (laughs) (laughs) So I get put in handcuffs, ankle cuffs, a chain around my waist, and cuffed to the chain around my waist, put in the back of the cop car, booked, Put in the jumpsuit, fingerprinted, mugshot, which we have. So if you want to throw the mugshot up there, that'd be great. Mugshot. <laughs> the whole nine yards. I'm, I have a cellmate with me in, in jail. My cellmate, because God will reach you in jail. My cellmate who was in there for breaking probation, first thing, I got the Bible. You want it? I'm like, no, I don't want your Bible. You know, and so I'm there in my jumpsuit, mad as a hornet, you know. And so they, they take me to prison. 
And um, or they take me to jail. The next morning, we go to court. I'm ankle cuffed, handcuffed, chain cuffed, everything cuffed. And I'm in this road chained to all these inmates, and they're escorting us to jail. And which I, mean, I didn't know you could you could go to jail for a suspended license. I mean, who knew? <laughs> And so they take me, they, they put us in a holding area before we go to the courtroom. And, oh, and also I had the one phone call, by the way. And of course, I call mom. Who else are you going to call? And I actually called her and I said, hey, what are you doing? She's like, I'm praying for you. I'm like, oh, this is why this happened. And I'm praying for you. And I was like, okay, um, I need you to come to Jackson, Tennessee in the morning and bail me out of jail. <laughs> And so, of course, you know, she's, she's there in the courtroom. But in the holding cell, guys, honest to God, I could not make this up. There's a row of us, of, of me and these other inmates. I mean, like, like, this guy committed, like, murder, you know? Like, why am I here? And, and this one cop beelines, like, he's coming in, you know, whenever the judge comes in, you stand. You know, he's going through all the protocol. And, you know, you address him as your honor whenever they, you know, guilty or not. You can plead guilty or not guilty. And he finishes his protocol spill, and he comes straight to me, like beelines to me, and he says, you know, there's a plan of God in your life, and you're going to destroy it. And, I mean, completely reads my mail. And I'm just like, why me? This guy killed someone. What did I do to me? And, you know, I go to court and, you know, tell him I don't have a suspended license. You know, it ended up getting cleared because I didn't have a suspended license. And the district attorney in Alabama had to write a letter to the judge in Tennessee saying this is incorrect. you got to clear her record. So he did. But all that mattered was in my mama's journal on April the 27th, it said, Lindsay is going to meet this guy. You do whatever you have to do to stop it from happening. All that matters is God tattletold and told mom, Lindsay's going to see this guy. And so she went to prayer. And she went to war. And I tell you what, I, I don't know what would have happened. I will never know what would have happened. But I know what didn't happen. What didn't happen is a meeting that could have destroyed my life. What could have happened is a meeting that would have meant I wouldn't be here today. I don't know. I know she prayed. And you don't know. You have no idea who is talking to them. I don't care if they're in jail. Pray, so, pray God sends him a cop. He will. <laughs> pray God sends him a cellmate. That's like, hey, my mama sent me a Bible today. You want to read it? I mean, he'll do that. <laughs> I've seen it. He'll do it. Do you guys ever, have you guys ever seen the show Deal or No Deal? Okay. I love this show. Again, I'm a sucker for stuff like that of like, <laughs> you picked the wrong suitcase. Sucker, you know. <laughs> um, but I was, you know, I was watching the show and 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 even just the concept of it kind of struck me as as interesting of the the tension between what's in front of you and what might be in your suitcase. You never know. All you know is what is exactly in front of you. That's all you see. You don't see what's in it. You just see what is directly in front of you. And, you know, the other day I was, I was, I was flipping through. I was reading um, in Exodus. And I was just, you know, just reading uh, before I go to bed. I'll just read, you know, the stories. And, and I was reading and I was thinking about it. And there was one, one thing that really stuck out to me is it's like, oh, man, it's like Moses is playing deal or no deal with Pharaoh. Literally. It's like a game of deal or no deal. And I found this so interesting that God gave Moses a very clear promise. One, in the burning bush. Two, whenever he said what, what we read a moment ago, where he gives them the word of, I will send you into the land I swore to give your ancestors. You know, I, gave to, I, I, I promised to give to Abraham, Isaac, I'm going to give it to you as your very own possession, for I am the Lord. I mean, it even goes on where he says later on, you will strip Egypt of their wealth, that the Egyptians will be giving you gold and silver wanting you to leave. And, and, and this is a promise, a very, very clear word that God gave to Moses to go to Pharaoh and say this. And even thinking about, you know, this being someone that Moses would have been very comfortable with. This is, this is his, his brother, more or less. 
and this is a family member to him, of going and saying these things. And I so found a parallel between my mother, my husband, the promises they were given, and the deals that the enemy were presenting them with. Because the enemy knew he can't break them. He's not going to break Casey. He's not going to break Karen. He's not going to break my sister or my friends. But if he could bend them to make them settle for something that's not quite God's promise, then he still wins. My mom was given 40 promises that she wrote down in her journal, 40. My husband had two. She had 40 that God had given her. I mean, everything from uh, me and Casey, to our, to our children, to ministry, to finances, I mean, everything. I mean, down to like, they will live in Hamilton. I mean, 40 promises that she had. And during that time, I mean, if you're a front porch friend, you've heard so many of these stories. She was absolutely unmoved. That it didn't matter what someone said to her. It didn't matter what circumstances looked like. To the point where my, my dad, he's my stepdad, but he's my dad, that, that he actually became worried about our mental health and was like, Karen, we're going to have to get you help. There's something wrong. <laughs> she, uh, one of my favorites is she had a word that said, uh, when the battle is over, you will wear the crown. And the Lord gives her this word, and she you know, writes it down, and then somebody would text her, Karen, I heard this word over you. When the battle is over, you will wear a crown. And then a couple of days later, someone else would text her. I heard this word over you. When the battle's over, you'll wear a crown. Someone would just send her a picture of a crown. And so she had a crown that she had received from youth camp years prior that she would wear around the house as a prophetic gesture that when this is over, we have the victory over this. And to the degree where she would, she would wear it so much that she forgot she was wearing it. And there was one moment where she and my dad were on the way to a restaurant, and uh, he, she was had on the crown. <laughs> and he looked over at her, and he's a very, very quiet, um, introverted, black and white type man. And he's driving, he looks at her, and he goes, are you going to wear it in? And Because she was just so used to wearing this. And she was like, if I need to wear it in. I mean, she didn't. She took it off. But, but it just became a lifestyle for her to be absolutely unmoved. This is the promise God gave me, and I don't care what it looks like, come hell or high water, we're not moving off of this word. I, there were ministers, she used to say she wanted just one person, just one person to say to her, my, my child was gone, my daughter was gone, my husband, anything. They were gone, I prayed, and it worked. I mean, she's, she has connections with hundreds of people, I mean, hundreds of ministers around the world, not one, not one, not one said, don't move. I don't care how bad it looks. Not one. All said, you know, whenever, you know, she's grown, she'll come back to God. It's like the word says, you know, you raised her in the way she should go. She won't depart from it. The marriage will be lost, but she'll come back to God. And, and she, went, she walked away from that meeting, and she actually, she was so angry, and she said to God, you know, this is not what you promised me. And one of the things that God actually spoke to her was, you're trying to get answers for everybody else. You've not asked what my answer is. And for you, what I want you to see is this. I want you to think about whenever Moses first goes to Pharaoh, and he has this promise. I want you to think about whatever promise it is that God has given you for your children, for your spouse, sister, brother, whoever it is you're believing for. And if you don't know what the promise is over them, look at this. This says, it's not my will that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Repentance is not, God, I'm sorry for what I did. Repentance is, I'm sorry for who I am right now, and I'm going to be whatever it is that you have called me to be. I don't care what it cost me. I will not be this person anymore. That's repentance. That's what God's will is for your loved one. It's, God, it's not God's will for your loved one that they come back and, yeah, they're okay. 
No, God, it's here. It's written. It's all right here. What's the promise over their life? Read it. It's all here. All of it is here. I want you to think about that promise that God gave you for them. And imagine, imagine even for Moses going up to Pharaoh and saying, you know, uh, this is the word. You know, God has given me. Let my people go. No. Okay. You know, he goes back and he's not moved. And he goes back to Israel and they're all saying, well, you said, God said this. What happened? Doesn't matter. God still said it. Doesn't matter. He goes back, says it again. Nothing happens. Goes back to the Israelites. Well, what now? What now, Moses? Well, well, I don't know. We're going to go back tomorrow. And the next day, and the next day. He didn't know how many plagues there were going to be. He had none of this knowledge. All he had was a promise. And that's it. That's it. It wasn't until the fourth plague. It was a plague of flies whenever Pharaoh looked at him and said, Okay, what do you want to do? <laughs> we're going to go worship. All right, so you can go, but do it here, do it here in this land. So, Moses, here's what the banker offers. Deal or no deal? Do you want to take the deal? Because it would have been so easy for Moses to say, you know, maybe I misheard God. Maybe that wasn't the way he promised me. Maybe, maybe I just kind of missed it. So he says no. He goes back. Now it's not until the eighth plague of locusts that Pharaoh bends again and he says, Okay, you can go, but only the men can go. Only the men. Well, it's a better deal, but no. No deal. The ninth plague, you can go, but leave all your livestock. You can even take the women and the little ones, but leave your livestock. This is my favorite moment of what Moses says to him. Let me see if I can even find, yeah, right here. What Moses says to him, we will not leave a hoof behind. (laughs) We will not leave even a hoof behind. And you've got to think, the promise to Moses was not the women and the children and the livestock. The promise was just, I'm going to send you into a land. And Moses was so unmoved that he got so detailed as to say, we're literally taking everything, everything, even the stuff from you. We're taking stuff from you too, Pharaoh. We're going to take the silver and the gold. We're taking it all. And I'm not moving until I see the fulfillment of this promise. And the fulfillment of your loved one is not, it is not, your loved one is going to come home, but they're going to struggle with addiction for the rest of their life. You're going to have a relationship with your kid, but they're not going to really, like, they're not going to be serving God the way that you always knew they were supposed to be serving God. That all those prophetic words you had for them whenever they were young, maybe you were just an excited parent, and that's not what God said. No, whatever God promised you, whatever he spoke over them, that's the way it's supposed to be. And you're not supposed to budge until you see that. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how easy it would be to say, you know, finally, for the first time in 10 years, we're getting along. I don't want to push. I don't want to, like, jeopardize anything and keep going too far and lose what we have right now. What you have right now is not God's will. This isn't it. God's will is not for them to be healed. God's will is for them to be whole. And those are two completely different things. Healing is, healing is, Lindsay comes home and they're back to where they were whenever they first got married. They're going to struggle with all of these things. Lindsay's going to have all of these daddy issues. There's going to be all, these, all this pain that if she and Casey are going to have to struggle with for the rest of their marriage. That's not God's will. God's will is not she's going to battle fear or your son's going to battle addiction or your child's going to battle gender identity. That's not God's will for their life. God's will is they will be somebody you've never met before. Because whenever God makes something whole, it's not what it was. It means the old thing has completely disappeared. And this is somebody that's never existed This is a daughter that the world hasn't seen before for you. This is a son that the world hasn't seen before. This is somebody that says, hey, you know what? You're dealing with this. I get it. Come here. Let me talk to you because I can get you out of this. Come here. Let me help you out of this because I've been there too. This is a daughter that will say, let me tell you, I've dealt with alcoholism. Come here. Let me get you out of this too. 
that they are shameless, they are fearless, they are absolutely on fire and burning for God. It doesn't necessarily mean that they will be in a pulpit or run a ministry. It means whatever you knew whenever you carried them, you knew that's the promise that you cannot move off of. That whenever you made those wedding vows before God and, and, and community, that you knew we're supposed to go through sickness and health, good and bad. That's God's will. Anything outside of that, you don't move off of that. Don't care what it looks like. I can't sit here and promise that restoration will happen. Nobody can promise that. Sadly, even, even God can't promise that. God still gives them a choice. But even in that choice, restoration is always right. And even though he won't make them choose right, he will make them really want to. <laughs> There's a saying that we have where it's, the pig pen always works. It always works. He will take away everything from them if that's what it takes. Everything. And it's going to be very difficult to see them go through some of this, to see them hurting, to see them lose things, to see them, I don't know, maybe even homeless. I don't know. But the pig pen always works. And even in the prodigal son story, there's one translation. There's one translation where it says, and he came to himself and said, I will go to my father's house. But that first thing was he came to himself. In that pig pen, he had to come to realize I'm a son. This isn't me. This is not what I'm supposed to, this is not it. This is not what I'm supposed to be doing. You'll know whenever that day comes, if, if they have completely changed. No, not if, when they have completely changed. My husband, whenever I came home, this was um, January 10th of uh, 2016. We'd been through two years of mediations, uh, court dates. We had to go through four different judges because all the judges knew my mom, so they had to step down from the case. And the case ended up getting sent to the Supreme Court of Alabama, and then they had to assign a judge who was not ministry-connected in any way because it's Alabama, it's the Bible Belt, you know. So they had to find somebody that did not know who our family was to handle the divorce case. So it was two years long. And, of course, I'm sitting there like, why is this taking forever? Of course, I'm not, at the time, I'm not even thinking about all the times mom is praying. You know, they're supposed to meet today. Don't let them meet today. <laughs> you know, the, it's supposed to go through today. Don't let it go through today. Um, court date is here. Let something happen where it gets delayed. And it did, one after another. You know, another case, another case took precedence, or the judge was sick, or he's out of town. It was one thing after another after another got delayed. And so January 10th, I woke up and in, in my apartment and weighed out, if I go home, this is what it's going to cost me. And I'm going to lose my reputation. I'm going to lose everything. That I will have to come out and tell the truth. I'm going to have to, to be honest about all these things that, that even my husband didn't know about at the time. You know, things that I had done in those two years. But if I stay... I'm, I'm going to lose my life. This is not worth it. I'm not happy. This is not what I thought this would be at all. And I remember I actually just looked up at my ceiling in my apartment, and all I did was I said, God, my answer is yes. Just as simple as that. God, my answer is yes. And in that moment, the overwhelming peace was indescribable. I would have to tell you in tongues. There's no way to, to say it in English of what it was like. Of knowing that it's not grace that comes first, and then I do it. It's obedience that comes first, and then the grace that follows that choice of obedience. It's not just going up to the altar and saying, oh, I'm dealing with this, and then picking it back up. It's I'm going to do whatever it is that I have to do to make this right, and I don't care what or who it cost me. At all cost, I'm going to get right with God, period, no matter what. I don't even care at the time. I, I don't even care if Casey says no to me wanting to go back home. I'm just going to keep asking him until he says yes. At some point, I'll wear him down, and he'll just give in. I don't even care. I'm going home. So long story short, I, met, uh, I went to my mom first, 
and um, told her, you know, I'd reached out to Casey, and I'd sent him an email asking if we could meet. He and I met two days later, and it was six hours in one meeting. And I didn't know at the time that he had said to God, in order for me to even give her a chance, she has to say these things. It was one after another. Uh, You know, she has to give up this person. She has to be willing to never speak to this one again. She has to cut these people off. I mean, these were family members, some of them, you know, uh, that had paid for the divorce. Um, You know, she has to be willing to give up dancing because at the time that was still my idol. You know, she has has to do all of this. And he said later, whenever I walked in, that all of those things were said in the first 15 minutes of our conversation because God knew what he needed, what he would need to hear, and God knows what you need. God knows if you're the one believing what you need to know that you know this is a different person. This is somebody, I've never even seen this person before. That, that you will know that. You'll have peace in that. That you don't have the questions of, oh, do we, like, is this the promise or is it not the promise? It will be undeniable to you. And you will know God has answered our prayer. We met for six hours that night. Actually, I picked up my keys to go home or go to my mom's house and because I just packed whatever I could. And he actually said to me, and I, and I told him, you know, I, I was a whore. I, I gave myself to anybody, and I was wrong, and I'm sorry, and I'll do anything I have to do to make this right with you, anything. And I told him I'll come back tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. And, um, and he actually said to me, I don't want you to leave. I want you to stay. In that moment, that showed me a picture of Jesus I, I, I'd never seen before. In all my 30 years of ministry, I'd never seen that. Of all the stories and all the things, I, I'd, never, I'd never seen that. Of absolute unconditional love for somebody. And, and that only comes whenever you decide, I'm going to trust him and only him. And I'm going to trust him not only to come through for them, but to come through for me. Because there's a lot of healing that has to happen in you. There's a lot of pain in you that God has to deal with. That if you don't let God deal with that, you might not let them come home when they do. There are some places in you that you have to make sure you don't even entertain the conversations of, you know what, maybe they're just going to be gone. That you don't say, you know, maybe you're right. There has to be a place of resolve in you that I, God is going to deal with them, and I won't move off of that. And I'm going to be at absolute peace with that. And know that the, the pain I have in me right now, God's going to heal this too. He's going to bring freedom to them, but he's going to bring healing to me. This is the last thing I, I want to show you guys. If you could do the picture, the, um, it's the, it's the, the date on it is the 4, 4, 10, 14. This was after I came home. My mother and I, uh, I had her Bible, and because I was actually preaching. And um, I had left my Bible at home, so I just grabbed hers. And I was flipping through, and the entirety of the Bible looks like that. It is all underlined and scribbled in. And, and when I was reading the dates, they were all in those two years. And this one, I, I have a few, I have three of the pictures I wanted to show you. Of the woman from Shunem Returns Home, it was dated April the 10th of 14. I just left. I left on March 17th of 14. And she had underlined all of this of just absolutely believing. And she would written down a glorious promise I have on the side. Now, she didn't know that she was one year and nine months away from seeing the fulfillment of that promise. And she could have quit that day. You can go to the next one is the 323. This one is the turnaround today boomerang. That was nine months, three weeks, and five days, and she didn't know that it wasn't that day. Turnaround today. It didn't happen that day. Words she got, turnaround today, didn't happen that day. Go to the next one. It's the December one. December 4th of 15. As the deer longs for the, for the water, where is this God of yours? My heart is breaking. I'm overwhelmed of how it used to be. That was one month and six days. And if she would have given in, what then? If she would have taken the deal, what then? And, that's, and then go to the last one. This is January 
10th, 11th, and 12th, he came. Oh, he came. And he saved my children. And he kept his word. That was the day that I emailed her that I was coming home. On January the 10th. So what you have to ask yourself, what is at the end of your promise? What do you want to see at the end of your promise? Of what you're believing for? If you will, everyone stand with me. You can, musicians can come on up. I, I, have no, I have no idea how long your journey could be. I don't know how hard it is. I don't know how long it's been. For some of you, it might have already been years and years and years. For some of you, it might have just started. But there is an end date. There is a tomorrow for you. There is a tomorrow at the end of this. There is a day whenever they say, I can't do this anymore. And something even my mother says is, is even if I take these prayers to the grave, I will take these prayers to the grave. And believe that these prayers will still have effect, even if I am six feet under, that I will take this to the grave because his promise will not come back void. If he said this and it doesn't happen, then all of heaven and earth has to pass away because this is the word of God. I don't know how long it'll be, but I do know what's it cost if you stop praying. I mean, life and death is at the end of this journey. And, and you have to choose. You have to choose. You have to be un- unbending that you will not take the deal that the, that the world offers you. And whenever friends and the enemy says, you know, well, it's going to be like this. No, absolutely not. And if it's a fight for the rest of your life, then it's a fight for the rest of your life. But you don't move off of that word. Raise your hands with me, if you will. Oh, Lord Jesus. God, you see every heart here this morning. You see the pain. You see the worry. You see the hurt. God, you see the faces of every face that is in their minds right now. You know all of their names. You know where all of them are at. You know what all of them are doing. And God, only you have the power to reach them. Only you have the power to get them wherever they are. Only you have the power to remove the scales from their eyes. And God, with the authority that you have given us as parents, as spouses, we speak that any, any mouth of the liar that is in their ear to be shut in Jesus' name. Any friend that they have connected themselves with, any soul tie that they have with anybody, it is broken in Jesus' name. That God, you cut off every relationship that is not your will. You cut off every friendship that is not your will, God. That in a moment, Lord, if they are out in a bar, that they sober in a moment, God. And that in the pig pen, they will remember who they are. That they are a son first. That they are a daughter first, God. And Lord, I pray that they would come running back to you with open arms, Lord. God, I pray they would come running back to you full of repentance. God, with ownership, Lord, that you would give them the grace that they have to have to walk through this journey of restoration. In Jesus' name, Lord, I speak peace over everyone here, peace over their minds. God, rest over them. Rest, peace peace that makes no sense that when the world says it's impossible, God, that it is not impossible. And Lord, that they will see even supernaturally, God, that they would, even, they would have prophetic words, God, that they would see what, what the world doesn't see. God, let them be lights for every prodigal here. Give them the words to say. Give them exactly what they need to do. Give them peace in that, God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.